And welcome to History of the Second World War, episode 121, the September Campaign Part 13, A Disappointing Beginning. Last episode, we discussed the debates occurring in London and Paris as the two governments tried to determine how they would react to the German invasion of Poland. Their previous agreements with Poland made it clear, at least to the Poles, that they should enter the war immediately and then aid the Poles in whatever way possible. In Warsaw, they hoped that this assistance would involve a French ground attack into western Germany, while the British used the Royal Air Force to begin a bombing campaign against Germany. But there was some hesitancy in both western capitals to jump into the war, and it was not until late in the evening on September 2nd that the decision was made to give Germany an ultimatum on the morning of September 3rd. The Germans would be aware that such an ultimatum was on its way, with the German ambassador in London sending this message to Berlin in the morning hours of September 3rd. Quote, By his statement today in the House of Commons on the reasons for Great Britain's delay in taking action, Chamberlain has excited the most violent indignation in the House of Commons and in the Cabinet, and the latter had threatened to resign in a body this evening, unless Chamberlain tomorrow finally gave Germany a declaration with a brief time limit. End quote. The official delivery of this message would be made by the two ambassadors, the British and the French ambassador, in Berlin. For the British, Neville Henderson, and for the French, Robert Coulandre. Henderson would arrive to deliver his message at 9 a.m. with the goal of giving it directly to the German foreign minister Ribbentrop. However, Ribbentrop decided not to meet with Henderson in person and instead just sent his interpreter, Paul Schmidt. The ultimatum would read, quote, More than 24 hours have elapsed since an immediate reply was requested to the warning of September 1st, and since then the attacks on Poland have been intensified. If His Majesty's government has not received a satisfactory assurance of the cessation of all aggressive action against Poland and the withdrawal of German troops from that country by 11 o'clock of British summertime, from that time a state of war will exist between Great Britain and Germany. End quote. The French version of the same message would be delivered at 10 a.m. with the same two hour window for acceptance, putting the French expiration at noon. Soon after the two messages were delivered, a note would be sent to the German embassies in London and Paris to give their ambassadors information on what had happened in Berlin. Quote, they, this is Henderson and Coulandre, were accordingly instructed to inform the Reich foreign minister that their governments would fulfill their obligations to Poland without hesitation, unless the Reich government were prepared to give definite assurances to the British and French governments that the government of the Reich would suspend all attacks on Poland and had made all preparations to withdraw their armed forces from Polish territory immediately. End quote. So that's how the German government, the German foreign ministry, summarized it to their two ambassadors. Over the next two hours, no serious discussions occurred in the German government of bowing to the new ultimatum, and instead time was spent creating a response that firmly rejected the French and British demands, restating many of the talking points that Hitler and other Nazi leaders had been using, I don't know, for years by that point. Treaty of Versailles was unfair, plotting against Germany, Polish violence against ethnic Germans, you know, the stuff we've been talking about for like 75 episodes now. At 11.12, Henderson would call London to confirm that no answer had been received in the 12 minutes since the ultimatum expired. Coulandre would then meet with Ribbentrop at 12.30, so that's 30 minutes after the French ultimatum expired, but the answer was the same that the British had received. With Coulandre shaking the hand of the state secretary Weizsäcker before leaving, with both men knowing their countries were about to be at war. With the German answer... Over the afternoon, the course in Paris and London became clear, and just after 6 p.m., Chamberlain would speak before the Commons. Quote, when I spoke last night to the House, I could not but be aware that in some parts of the House there were doubts and some bewilderment as to whether there would be any weakening, hesitation, or vacillation on the part of His Majesty's government. In the circumstances, I make no reproach, for if I had been in the same position as honorable members not sitting on this bench and not in possession of all of the information which we have, I should very likely have felt the same. The statement which I have to make this morning will show that there, w there were no grounds for doubt. We were in consultation all day yesterday with the French government, and we felt that the intensified actions which the Germans were taking against Poland allowed no delay in making our own position clear. 
Accordingly, we decided to send to our ambassador in Berlin instructions which he has to hand at nine o'clock this morning to the German foreign secretary, and which read as follows. Sir, in the communication which I had the honor to make to you on 1st of September, I informed you on the instructions of His Majesty's Principal Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs that unless the German government were prepared to give His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom satisfactory assurances that the German government had suspended all aggressive action against Poland and were prepared promptly to withdraw their forces from Polish territory, His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom would, without hesitation, fulfill their obligation to Poland. Although this communication was made more than 24 hours ago, nor no reply has been received, but German attacks upon Poland have continued and intensified. I have accordingly the honor to inform you that unless not later than 11 a.m. British summer time, today, September 3rd, satisfactory assurances to the above effect have been given by the German government and have reached His Majesty's government in London, a state of war will exist between the two countries as of that hour. That was the final note. No such undertaking was received by the time stipulated, and consequently, this country is at war with Germany. Chamberlain would then go on to say, This is a sad day for all of us, and to none is it sadder than to me. Everything that I have worked for, everything that I have hoped for, everything that I have believed in during my public life has crashed into ruins. There is only one thing left for me to do, that is to devote what strength and powers I have to forwarding the victory of the cause for which we have to sacrifice so much. I cannot tell what part I may be allowed to play myself. I trust that I may live to see the day where Hitlerism has been destroyed and a liberated Europe has been reestablished. End quote. As was customary in the House of Commons, especially when the Prime Minister made such an announcement, there were many responses from other leaders. I won't read all of them, but I will give you Churchill's response here. Quote, we must not underrate the gravity of the task which lies before us, or the temerity of the ordeal to which we shall not be found unequal. We must expect many disappointments and many unpleasant surprises, but we may be sure that the task which we have freely accepted is not one beyond the compass and the strength of the British Empire and the French Republic. The Prime Minister said it was a sad day, and that is indeed true. But at the present time, there is another note which may be present, and that is the feeling of thankfulness that, in these great trials were to come upon our island, there is a generation of Britons here now ready to prove itself not unworthy of the days of yore, and not unworthy of those great men, the fathers of our land, who laid the foundations of our laws and shaped the greatness of our country. End quote. Back in Berlin, with Britain at war, the only things left for Henderson to do in Berlin were to further inquire as to whether or not Germany would follow the international agreements on warfare. He would meet once again with the foreign ministry and ask, quote, I have the honor to inquire whether the German governments are prepared to give an assurance to His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom that they will observe the provisions of the Geneva Protocol, signed on the 17th of June 1925, prohibiting the use of asphyxiating poisonous and other gases and of bacteriological methods of warfare. End quote. France would declare war on Germany at the same time as the British, 5 p.m. on September 3rd, with the German government notified of the time after the French ultimatum had expired, quote, In consequence of the government of the Republic, have the honor to inform the government of the Reich that they find themselves obliged to fulfill, as of today, September 3rd, 5 p.m., the obligations which France has entered into towards Poland, and which are known to the German government, end quote. In Germany, the news of September 3rd was more focused on the successes in Poland, and then on September 4th, the news of the declarations of war would be suppressed. When it became widely known, there was some initial shock among many average Germans, as Hitler had for years said that he would keep Germany out of another world war, and it was the success to kind of prevent a large conflict during the Anschluss and the Munich crisis that had made Hitler's position in Germany completely unassailable. In Poland, the news was trumpeted as a huge victory. Vladislav Spilman, just a child in 1939, would be listening to the radio and would later recall that, quote, We learned that we no longer faced our enemy alone. We had a powerful ally and the war was certain to be won, end quote. 
But while the news of Britain and France joining the war was an important step towards long-term victory, in the short term, the declaration did little to prevent the daily bombing raids of Warsaw and other Polish cities and towns, or to stop the Germans that were, by September 4th, advancing on all fronts and towards the capital. What the Poles desperately needed was quick, decisive, and powerful action from their allies in Western Europe. And wow... Were they about to be very dis- quick and decisive action against Germany? It was going to have to be a campaign from the air. With the French leaders far more concerned with the possibility of a German ground attack, or maybe the possibility of launching their own, that air campaign would have to be led by the Royal Air Force. At 5 p.m. London time on September 3rd, the first of the countless war cabinet meetings would be held with all of the major British political and military leaders present. Several pressing topics were discussed, and one of those was the idea and and possibilities for a quick airstrike against targets in Germany. The overriding concern among the group was that if they were to bomb Germany, which the RAF was fully capable of doing, it would only invite reprisals from the Luftwaffe. In the words of Lord Halifax, quote, Britain should not be the first to take the gloves off. This fear made the British leaders resistant to any calls for a major bombing campaign on Germany in general, and absolutely reject the idea of bombing any population centers. In the meeting notes for this war cabinet meeting, the views and decisions made by the cabinet would be summarized as, quote, In our view, it was important to take no action in violation of the attitude which our two governments had taken up in regards to our bombardment policy. It was understood to be the intention of the French Air Force to carry out reconnaissance with a view to locate troop concentrations on the railways and on military aerodromes. Bombing attacks would be carried out between, but not on, railway stations and on aerodromes. Trains would not be attacked. End quote. As you can see in some of these notes, the restrictions placed on bomber command were were very tight limits on what they could do while over Germany. There would still be efforts to strike against purely military targets, and the first British bombing raid of the war would be launched a bit after 3 p.m. on September 4th, with 15 Blenheim and 14 Wellington medium bombers being sent to attack the German warships that were anchored near Wilhelmshaven. And in a a really interesting situation, they were only to be attacked if they were not docked out of fear of bombs causing civilian casualties among dockyard workers. So they could only attack the German ships if they were not actually in port. The Blenheims would focus most of their attention on the cruiser Emden and the pocket battleship Admiral Scheer, managing to hit the Scheer four times, but none of the bombs exploded. For their troubles, five of the Blenheims would be shot down by anti-aircraft fire. The force of Wellingtons would be unable to find any ships to attack at all and would return home. Not exactly a splendid success for the opening efforts of the war by the Royal Air Force. Another attempt would be made to execute a similar bombing attack against the German fleet late in September with roughly the same results. The British would learn, as almost every other nation would over the next six years, that hitting naval targets with medium and heavy bombers while the ships were underway was incredibly challenging. Speaking of naval targets, the Royal Navy would also be active during the first days of the war, and over the course of the first week they would capture five German merchant ships, but it was the German efforts against merchant shipping that are of course far more famous, with the German U-boats being given the orders to begin operations against British shipping just hours after the official declaration of war. The Royal Navy was prepared for this, though. They had had to be, you know, after how devastating the German submarines had been during the First World War and the Admiralty would begin anti-submarine patrols almost immediately after war was declared. But these patrols could could not be everywhere at once, and during the opening days of the war, there would be several successful attacks by U-boats on both British and French shipping. But there was also hope that as the Royal Navy continued in to kind of get better organized, better equipped, uh, the merchant fleets, uh, you know, became more accustomed to the new realities of warfare and, and convoy structures, that the number of ships that would be destroyed would begin to go down. Here is the summary from the War Cabinet meeting on September 6th. Quote, the first Lord of the Admiralty reported that five merchant ships, four British and one French, had been sunk by submarine that previous day. 
there was reason to believe that the position from our point of view was probably now at its worst and would improve. Rigorous steps were being taken to ensure that merchant ship captains obeyed the instructions given to them. End quote. Then on September 11th, so eight days after the start of hostilities, a full summary of the losses to German submarines would be provided to the cabinet up to that point in time. First Lord of the Admiralty, in the first five days of the war, our average loss had been 11,000 tons per day, whereas in the last three days it has fallen to 5,000 tons per day. But it is too early to accept these figures as definite proof that our measures were meeting with success. End quote. Obviously, over the next, you know, two years, the situation with the U-boats would get get a lot worse. But there was, you know, a week into the war, 11 days into the war, there was some cause for optimism with the, the total tonnage being sunk going down a little bit. Speaking of these cabinet notes, which I've already quoted several times, if you're looking for interesting bits of reading, might I recommend taking a trip through some of the British War Cabinet conclusion papers, which can be found at a link in the show notes. They are summaries of all of the war cabinet meetings that were held during the war, which can range from just a few pages to several, many pages. There are limits to what you can learn from these notes, but it's also interesting to see what the British military and political leaders were discussing during this time period. For example, during the meeting on September 4th, there was some discussion of the reaction around the world to the war. This included how certain nations might react to the various actions that the British government could take. For example, Halifax would address the idea of shoring up the Far East by entering into negotiations with Japan. He would say, quote, Any suggestion of the revival of our alliance with Japan, even as a long-term objective, would need to be very carefully considered from the point of view of its effect upon the United States of America. End quote. But then later in the meeting, they turned to the problem of public gatherings, particularly theaters and cinemas. Quote, It was suggested to the War Cabinet that the closing of theaters and cinemas, if continued indefinitely, would have a bad effect on public morale. It was pointed out that, in the uncertainties of the present stage of the war, it would not be justifiable to encourage crowds to gather in public places, particularly in central London. On the other hand, it was suggested that there was a case for permitting places of entertainment to open in the hours of daylight and possibly also in the suburbs after dark, end quote. Along with these more far afield topics, there was also, of course, constant discussions about what was happening in Poland while the September campaign continued. The exact evaluations given to British leaders would vary based on the day, with one note on September 7th saying that the position of Poland was, for the moment, a little easier, while on September 8th there would be a new report based on the experiences of a representative that had been flown to Poland, and it, which would say that the situation was now extremely serious. These cabinet papers will be a frequent topic for the podcast over the coming months and probably years, honestly, as I think they hold particular insight and interest during the phony war period, but I think they can be an interesting source for anyone who wants to learn more about what British leaders were discussing and why they thought, you know, certain topics were important enough to spend time on them during these very high-level war cabinet discussions, especially at times of kind of great stress, like, like the first several weeks of the war. While the British were planning and launching air attacks at German naval targets, in Paris, plans for a French attack into western Germany was being put into action. On September 5th, an overview of the French plan was conveyed to the British, with the French planning for a small invasion into the Saarland, with a few other small reconnaissance efforts that were more focused on finding and evaluating German defenses rather than mounting a a serious offensive into Germany. The primary reason for the small French effort was that French leaders, including General Gamelin, believed that it was crucial that France conserve as much strength as possible for the war ahead. If the Polish forces were going to be overwhelmed quickly, then expending French resources and lives to try and distract the Germans would do little in the long run other than waste those French resources and Frenchmen. Because of this, the French offensives during the second week of September were very limited in scope and objectives. On September 7th, the 2nd Army Group would begin a few small probing attacks, and on the 9th, the 4th Army would send five infantry divisions and four tank battalions into the Saarland. The Germans offered little resistance, and the French would be allowed to advance almost 13 kilometers into Germany. The advance was extremely cautious, though, and would end when they encountered any real German resistance. There were also some aerial battles that would occur over the French advance, with several German and French aircraft destroyed due to French efforts at aerial reconnaissance. 
Now, what the French did not know was that at that moment, they enjoyed a very considerable advantage in troops and equipment in Western Germany. The total number of troops was uh, somewhere around the French outnumbering the Germans around two to one, but the German troops in the area were far from the best in the Wehrmacht, and many were poorly trained reservists. The complete lack of action even surprised the German commander in the West, General Wilhelm Ritter von Lieb, who would write, quote, Evidently they are not ready, or they don't want to pick the chestnuts out of the fire and are waiting for the British. End quote. One of the reasons French hesitancy was the German defenses known as the Siegfried Line, or the West Wall, had been sort of consumed so many German resources and man hours over the previous years before the war, and it was believed that these defenses were much stronger than they actually were. In fact, they were far from completed, and their kind of reputation far outpaced their usefulness. The first meeting of the Supreme War Council would take place on September 12th, with both French and British military and political leaders in attendance. There were conversations about past actions and British and French actions for the near future. The the French made it clear that they did not intend for their attacks to be greatly successful or to advance far into Germany or hold a lot of territory. The British would support them in this decision, with Chamberlain making it clear that he believed that time was against the Germans. A joint communication would be issued by Chamberlain and Dalladay after the meeting was over, saying in part, quote, This meeting has fully confirmed the strength of the resolve of Great Britain and France to devote their entire strength and resources to the waging of the conflict that has been forced upon them, and to give all possible assistance to their Polish ally, who is resisting with such gallantry the, the ruthless invasion of her territory, End quote. But these were just empty words. In Britain, Poland, and the Eastern Front 1939, uh, Anita Przemowska would use this phrase to describe what the first meeting of the Supreme War Council really was, and this is the best summation I've ever read. Quote, it was a veritable orgy of mutual congratulations at not having succumbed to the temptation of attacking Germany. <laughs> Which is just a great way to describe the meeting. They knew when they were writing that joint communication that their words were empty and that there was no real help that would be provided to Poland. Sadly for the Polish civilians fleeing from the German invasion, the Polish citizens who were being bombed by German aircraft, the Polish soldiers fighting against the German troops, all of those soon to suffer under German occupation, the territory of occupation growing by the day. The truth was that there was no help on the way. And so they had to defend themselves. Next episode, we will jump back to Poland to talk about what had happened after the first few days of the invasion as the Polish armies continued to have to retreat. <laughs>